Hello, my name is Sarah Bullock. I'm a 2013 Wallace Society uh, Leadership Institute participant, and we have here Wayne Reglin. He's been with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game for 30 years, and we were in Juneau, Alaska. This is September 4th, 2013. So, Wayne, could you tell me about uh, your place of birth and when you were born? Sure, I was born in Holdridge, Nebraska mm -hmm. in 1946. So I'm 66 years old. Uh, I grew up on a farm near Holdridge. Mm -hmm. uh, had a small dairy farm and five kids in the family. Nice, nice. Um, what university did you attend? Well, the first two years of college, I went to a small, two different small schools in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. I would have never gone to college except I went to play football and decided I liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I transferred after I decided that I wanted to be a wildlife biologist. I transferred to Colorado State University in 1966 and got my bachelor's degree there in uh, 1969. And then I stayed and went and got my master's uh, at Colorado State. I was all set up and had a, a fellowship to go to graduate school at Iowa State and work on pheasants. Mm -hmm. And just before I was ready to go, Dr. Julius Nagy, a professor of wildlife nutrition at Colorado State, came and asked me to stay and work with him and a guy named Charles Wamo or Dr. Charlie Wamo. And so I did because I did I was gonna be working on pheasants and I much wanted to work on deer. So I did that and I got my master's degree from Colorado State in nineteen seventy one. And then uh, when I finished that, uh, Charlie Walmo, who was a wildlife, principal wildlife biologist for the U.S. Forest Service at the Rocky Mountain Forest and Range Experiment Station, hired me as uh, to work for him, and my job was to go on and get my Ph.D. Mm -hmm. And so I did that, and got my, I finished my Ph.D. in 1976. So I got all three of my degrees at the same university. Nice. All right, sweet. Um, so how did you decide to pursue the career in wildlife management? Well, you know, I grew up on a farm where we did a lot of hunting and fishing, and uh, a little bit of trapping, but mostly hunting, and always was outdoors a lot. And I went to college and had no idea what I wanted to do when I was a freshman, and uh, thought I might be a school teacher. And then I got into biology when my second year and decided that I thought I would be a game warden conservation officer. So I went to and decided to go to Colorado State and once I got there I, I realized pretty quickly that what I really wanted to do was be a biologist. So. Awesome. And I, I had a good career that way. Mm -hmm. So um, what hobbies, books, or events influenced your career choice? You know I think it wasn't a book. I didn't know any, very hardly anything about wildlife management uh, until I got to Colorado State. I thought it was you know, I was going to be a game warden, mm -hmm. and so I can't say it's any books, but I think it was just my uh, all the time we spent hunting and in the outdoors that mm -hmm. influenced me a great deal. And then once I started, I realized the science part really, I got really into that and really enjoyed that. Cool. So you you did did go hunting and fishing? Oh yeah, still do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, who were some of your mentors? Oh, well, I think the. My first mentor was Charlie Wamo uh, in the literature. He's O.C. Wamo. He was a student of Leopold's, very well-known research biologist. Did much, much work in uh, the work, mostly in habitat management. And worked in Arizona and Colorado and in Alaska. Then mm -hmm. uh, did a, worked up here for a while. He was probably the the person that shaped my career the most and was my mentor. Both on my master's degree, he was the person that I worked with in the field, mm -hmm. and then for my PhD, he was my supervisor, uh, not my major professor, because he was part of the Forest Service, not the university. But uh, so he was my. But I had another when I first went to work for the state of Alaska Fish and Game Department. I guess uh, my boss there was Dick Bishop, and. I was a, had always been a research biologist, and I suppose in an ivory tower to a degree. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I'm a research coordinator and thrust into the management realm. Mm -hmm. And Dick was the regional supervisor, and he was very influential and, and very helpful in 
teaching me how to uh, deal with people and the public and, and then the management implications and how to, how to deal with those kinds of things. And I think there's one more that's sort of a strange one. It was a guy that I, I, he worked for me, was Dr. Bill Gassaway. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, has always written hundreds of publications and was a real expert in predator prey management. And I came, I had always been in, working in wildlife nutrition and habitat and had a very strong background. And I had a lot of statistics courses, but not a background in population dynamics. And, you know, just through working with him, I learned so much. And he really uh, was valuable to my career and so helpful and taught me so much. And he, he, went over, he retired and went over to Africa to study predator prey management, but he, he died early when he was only about 60. He had got cancer, so he's gone. Mm -hmm. But I think all of them influenced me in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, Walmo, you know, was just a taskmaster. He was a scientist all the way, you know, just brutally honest. And that's how we always would say what you had to be as, as a scientist, be brute, you know, with yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just have to tell the truth to whatever the questions are. You, whatever answers you find, you tell the people the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I see people, some people have a real reluctance to do that. Okay. Awesome. So, um, what aspects of your formal education was most useful in your career? Well, I think it probably, the first part of my career, I was worked as a research biologist and as a, I, I would say as a scientist. So, and there it was probably the coursework in statistics. I probably had seven or eight courses in statistics and, and then more mathematics. And that be, was very useful to me and helpful uh, to design research projects and, and to get all you can out of a research project. But, so I would say the statistics courses, but also the, you, know, you, you have to have the biological courses too. And I went to Colorado State and they had an excellent program uh, and took a lot of zoology courses. And by the time, I, because I went, got all three degrees there, by the time I was done, I took all the wildlife courses and, uh, and most of the physiology courses. As when I, on my master's, I specialized in animal physiology. And then for my PhD, it was, I kind of got into plant nutrition, plant physiology, mm -hmm. so I, and, and habitat manipulation, so. Uh, but your question, back to your question, and as a, we, then I became an administrator about halfway through my career. Mm -hmm. And I would say the thing that, you know, I, I, when I thought about the question yeah, I knew you were going to ask, and I thought, what was it? It was probably English <laughs> writing. Mm -hmm. When I was a freshman, they had a writing lab. And you had to go in, and all you did, you sat there for a whole afternoon once a week and wrote. And had a tutor and there were like six of us in, uh, in that class and I learned how to write and then Charlie Womo was an excellent writer and publisher and he taught me how to write the scientific uh, writing and so those uh, the writing in English were the things I think for in the administrative side because mm -hmm. you needed it also as a to write scientific articles but once you became a administrator you did a lot of writing and you had to communicate mm -hmm. with so many people. So. Great. So uh, tell about your family. Tell us about your, uh, your spouse. Uh, uh, we married uh, in 1970. Her name is Mary Lou. Mm -hmm. She grew up in Aspen, Colorado. We met at Colorado State when I was an undergraduate and we got married uh, just as, as I finished my master's degree. So mm -hmm. we were dated for about three years before we got married. We have uh, two children. Uh, I have a daughter that is the oldest, and she's a librarian in Cleveland, Ohio, has three grand, with three kids. And my son is a dentist in Spokane, Washington, and he has two kids. So none of my kids became biologists, although uh, my son uh, got a bachelor's degree in biology and biochemistry. Mm -hmm. And then he worked for a while as a, in a research lab uh, for Genentech, a big company. And he decided that he wanted to go back and go to dental school because he didn't want to live in a great big city the rest of his life. <laughs> awesome. 
So, um, did any members of your family pursue wildlife related? No, I'm the only one that, that did that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, how did your career affect your family? Well, it really had a major impact because after when I finished my PhD, I had two job offers. One was in West Virginia, working on squirrels, and the other one was in Alaska, working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and I took that job. So it moved us to Alaska. I worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service for the Denver Wildlife Research Center, and they had a field station in Kenai, Alaska. Mm -hmm. So we moved up here and thought it would just be for a short time, and it really, uh, something we all liked it here, and have been here now 36 years. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is the opportunities to travel. Mm -hmm. I've really, uh, through the job, I've been uh, many, many opportunities to travel all around the world. And my wife has gone with me at lots of times. We took the whole family, uh, I think it was in 1987. Uh, I spent four months in Poland and they let go with me. I was selected to be a, an exchange scientist between the national U.S. The, our National Academy of Science and the Soviet Eastern European Academy of Sciences, and they. So I went over there for uh, four months and w tried to work on roe deer, to do some comparative work between roe deer, the smallest cervid, mm -hmm. their smallest deer family, and. Uh, uh, moose which was the largest and I'd done a lot of work and I was going to do it but they just didn't have the animals they told me would be real tame. So I spent the four months traveling around Poland lecturing at various different uh, research sites and helped the Polish government put on this major wildlife conference. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got to travel a great deal. I've been uh, later on in my career I was uh, represented uh, the 50 states on CITES, so I've been to mm. Thailand and Chile and all, you know, lots of different places. So, got to do a lot of fun things that way. So, that's really had an influence on our life and our family. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, let's go into your professional experience. So, how did you get your first job? Well, when I was, you know, I worked from the time I got to Colorado State. I was a non resident, it was expensive. So, I started working as a work-study student right away, and that's how I met Charlie Walmo. He was my uh, supervisor as a work-study student. And so, I, and then when I finished my master's, I, I worked in the summers always for Colorado Department of Wildlife, and then uh, worked for the Forest Service. And so I was a wildlife technician all, for five years for the U.S. Forest Service, or the Rocky Mountain Experiment Station, while I got my PhD. Mm -hmm. And I consider that work. I published several papers during that, and uh, it was kind of a fun, a fun job because my job was to get you know the research that I set up was uh, all for my PhD, mm -hmm. and I did a few other things too uh, on habitat manipulation on deer winter range. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of those things. So, uh, but once I finished my PhD, I had. An opportunity to come to Alaska. I, they, I wasn't going to apply for the job. I thought it was too far away. And uh, actually, uh, Chuck Stone, the project leader out of Denver, came and came to my house and and sat down with me and says, "Why aren't you applying for this job?" <laughs> and and I said, "Well, it's just a long ways away, and I wasn't sure that it was." where I wanted to go and I wasn't sure I wanted to work for the Fish and Wildlife Service. I was still thinking about working for the Forest Service or mm -hmm. experiment stations and he says, would you fly to Alaska would you, if I pay your way, would you go up and look at the job? And I, it was after that there was no doubt, you mm -hmm. know, and it was a kind of a job that it was Senator Stevens was a newly uh, appointed person, member of the Senate Appropriations Committee in 1976, and he got money as, you know, first of much, many millions of dollars in 1976, uh, $50,000 a year for five years for somebody to study moose habitat on the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. Mm -hmm. And so I had money 
and more than you could believe in those days, yep. in, in 1977. So I accepted the job, and that's how I got to know Senator Stevens, and we had a lot of relationship that paid off for many years as we worked together on lots of things and got a lot of money for the Department of Fish and Game mm -hmm. uh, because he loved to dole out the pork. <laughs> yes. So. so, let's see. Um, describe your first prof professional position. Was it, it was with the federal? Right? It was, yes, it was with the Fish and Wildlife Service. It was, the nicest thing was well, I came up here and John Oldemeyer was a field station leader mm -hmm. and we were working on the Kenai uh, on habitat improvement. We had these big tree crushers and uh, we're going to crush trees and what I was going to do was uh, set up a major logging operation to show that moose habitat and logging were compatible and how to do it in small patches and spent a year designing it and collecting all the pretreatment information. And then Jimmy Carter was president at the time, and he decided, after he'd been a president for almost three years, that they were going to manage the Fish and Wildlife Service just like the Park Service, and there would be no more habitat manipulation, period. So there was no more tree crushing, there was no logging it for sure, mm -hmm. and uh, so I switched gears and worked on moose physiology and nutrition. Uh, still had the money, and switched over to working on, uh, I had. We raised tame moose, built an built a big uh, nutrition research center at the Moose Research Center, and worked with Al Franzman and Chuck Swartz, two guys from Fish and Game. Mm -hmm. So even though I was a federal employee, I worked at the at the Moose Research Center, which is a state facility, but it's on the refuge. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, looked at we determined the energy requirements of moose, the protein requirements. Uh, we built a a chamber that I could measure the exchange of oxygen and CO2 mm -hmm. and also we could collect everything that went into a moose and everything that came out and mm -hmm. did all that. And published a lot of papers on it but our main reason what we were trying to do was work on the carrying capacity of moose and I also spent a lot of time and had several graduate students work on the forage quality and the amount of forage and we built a model, a, car what, a carrying capacity model based on what a moose requirements were and what was available. So, and it was sort of pioneering work in, in the area of carrying capacity. It was, and I think what I learned was, it's really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, there's too much area, there's too much variability. What you probably really need to do is use the moose as an indicator or whatever animal you're studying and other physiological traits and reproduction. But, it was work, a lot of people, uh, still, it's still used a lot. A lot of people say we should know the carrying capacity before you manipulate a population. And there's ways to do that, but it's extremely difficult. But I spent a lot of time doing that and had a lot of, a lot of fun doing it. Okay, so where did you go from there? Uh, well, when I, uh, I had five years of money. Mm -hmm. And after five years, the Fish and Wildlife Service had their priorities were that they weren't going to work on species that were hunted, Carter's philosophy again. And so I could have stayed there at the Kenai and worked on swans. Mm -hmm. But I was uh, offered a position with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game in Fairbanks as the uh, research, what they call the research coordinator. It was the person that research, supervised all the research biologists working in the northern half of the state. We split at the Alaska range. So, and I took that job. And it was, uh, in those days, in 1982, the state paid better than the feds. Mm. And so I, uh, now it's much different. Uh, the federal government employees are way ahead. But in those days, uh, they, the state paid really well because the pipeline construction was just ending. The benefits were tremendous because they had to do that trying to keep employees. So I took that job in 1982 as research coordinator. I continued to work at the Moose Research Center for about three years because I had graduate students. And at the research center, there's four large pens that are square mile each, and we had them all stocked with various numbers of moose. So we spent a lot of time trying to validate our carrying capacity model 
and we would predict, you know, what would do it, uh, various things, and then we were able to test it. So it was an interesting thing, and I, and I spent a lot of time publishing that. But I also supervised, I think, ten, maybe eleven. Uh, research biologists working all over the North Slope and all over the northern part of Alaska on a lot of predator-prey relationship, caribou and moose and wolves and lynx and sheep and bears. So a little bit of everything and broadened my experience. That's where I met Bill Gassaway. He was a, a moose biologist but an expert in predator-prey. He's written a monograph on it and lots of articles and and so I, I did that and uh, the fun part of that job was, just after I got there, uh, Congress and was pushing real hard to open the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for oil development on the 1002 area, which is about 320,000 acres on the coast of the plain where they know there's a lot of oil. And Congress, we got over a million dollars a year for several years to study that because there was tremendous controversy about it. It was sort of the environmentalist, you know, uh, favorite subject, I would say, or, you know, the thing that they really used, a lot of the groups were adamantly opposed to it, even though they'd never been there and didn't know what was going to happen. But it was it was an argument over wilderness versus non-wilderness, but they used wildlife for it. So we set up all these studies and I worked with a guy named Larry Pank from the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we were co-project leaders, but we had biologists from Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife Service, Canadian Wildlife Service, the Yukon government, and lots of, and, and Dave Klein at the University and Bob White at, at UAF. So we had lots of graduate students on the project, and we studied a little bit of everything. Uh, even geese, songbirds, uh, Focus was always on caribou because that's where it was. And Pank and I said, "How in the world these caribou move a thousand miles? You know, the porcupine herd winters in uh, southern or way far south, well, uh, or around Whitehorse, and then they travel way north." And so we started working with satellite radio collars and worked with the, uh, Dave Beatty was owned Talonix, and he was interested in building satellite collars. They'd had, at that time, this was in 84, 85, 86, they could use satellite radio collars on, on uh, whales and other marine mammals in the, because, but because they, the water temperature is very stable. Nobody had ever done it with marine mammals, or with terrestrial mammals. It, and so uh, we've got, we entered a cooperative program with Dave and we devised, he built them we, first we put them on caribou with the pens. First we had them in my house to see if they'd work at all. Uh, then we had them at the, put them on uh, reindeer at the university's facilities. And then we put the first six out on the porcupine caribou herd. And we didn't have any, you know, I remember every night at 11 o'clock I'd go in and get on the computer, which was this big box, because we didn't have many computers those days. And, uh -huh. I'd call Dave, and he and the, they were polar orbiting satellites, so they and that's why they wanted to do it in Alaska. Mm -hmm. They go over. They had the polar orbiting satellites would <coughs> circle Alaska every six times a day, whereas like on the equator once a day. So we that's why we did that. And he'd call and he'd, he'd tell me where they were, and I had a big map on the wall with dots, and and then we would go out and we'd test if we were close, you know, did some of that, and and it worked, and so. Then I hired, since it was working, we were pretty sure it was going to work, we got, I got a graduate student named Steve Fancy. I don't know if you ever knew Steve. He got his PhD at the University of Alaska. And he, he put everything together with help from other people, but on, we computerized the whole thing. But for the first three months, it was a big map, a map the size of this wall with dots on it where the caribou were. And then pretty, and you know, it was just labor intensive. And then, now it's all totally computerized, and from that, uh, now we use satellite radio collars on almost everything. They've gotten smaller, 
they've got GPS capabilities, and we if we could get within a hundred yards, we were happy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or even because we, but we could track those caribou, uh, and actually before we were done, we put them put satellite collars in a in in uh, scoters because they were a deal up there internally, and they we found out that the scoters were back and forth from the North Slope to the Fairbanks area th several times a year. Amazing animal. They, we found the caribou moved so much, you know, much more than we ever anticipated. So we learned a lot of things and that's one of the funnest things I ever did. It was just cutting edge, you know, and really fun to do. Mm -hmm. So I did that project myself while I had, uh, but we had lots of other people doing, working on other species and that kind of thing. So. Then I, uh, in 1988, you know, was, I'd done this for six or seven years and uh, I got offered the job as being deputy director of the wildlife division. And I didn't do it. I said no for quite a while and finally they, they talked me into it and I, so I became an administrator and phased out of the research. and. Uh, so I was deputy director for eight years, uh, and then uh, was became director for eight years, and then I was uh, then I retired when Frank Murkowski got elected governor because we had we were uh, we had a long history of not working well together, and he became governor. So I decided I was retired. I wasn't ready to quit working, but I was I retired because uh, I wasn't going to let him fire me. <laughs> uh, because it, go, it went all the way back to Anwar. He was a very strong proponent of Anwar development. And what I kept, what we found was, you know, back then they couldn't didn't have angle drilling. Is the, the caribou? Uh, we needed to protect the calving areas where the caribou calved, and he didn't want to do that. And he, he wanted a hundred be able to develop a hundred percent. And I remember one day I says, you know, you there's billions of dollars up there, and you can get eighty percent of those billions of dollars, or you'll get nothing. And he wouldn't compromise. And he blamed me. Uh, so we were kind of adversaries. And then he got elected governor, so I left. And then it was sort of a unusual circumstance. Uh, I helped him uh, set up several things before I left on predator management because he wanted to do that in a big way. He'd kind of ran on that platform. Uh, and I had a lot of experience there, even though we hadn't done much, because Cooper or, or, uh, Knowles was governor then when I was director. But uh, Murkowski wanted to name a commissioner that would have a lot of background in fisheries. And the Board of Game and the Board of Fish wouldn't put that name forward to the legislature without me being, coming back as deputy commissioner. And I said no for a while and finally he talked me into it and it was a nice, it worked out, you know, I worked, worked we learned to respect each other, we worked well together. Uh, he was a very difficult man to work for. I don't know if you know him, but he tried to, kind of intimidate people. That was his management style and it didn't work very well with me and I found out what he really liked was people that fought right, you know, yelled right back at him. <laughs> so we worked out and worked well together and then I retired when he left and uh, because after I did, was deputy commissioner then for about three and a half years and then I retired because I was ready to quit, go play and do other things. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of a capsule of my career. I probably got way off of your questions. Yeah, no, you did great. Um, so what were the pay and benefits like? To oh, remember? you know, I remember when I first came to Alaska, you got the 25% coal and I made $27,000 a year and I thought I was rich. You know, we kind of had always been not ha have much money and so we were able to buy a house right away and everything. And then, I, uh, when I went to work for the state, it was probably thirty-five thousand a year, and just wonderful benefits for medical, twenty-year retirement, uh, and full ben medical benefits after you retire for the rest of your life. 
So it, that's been really good for me, and that's all changed now. Fishing game, I they have they've changed the retirement system four times. I was tier one because I was the original with all of the wonderful benefits, and now they're on tier four, and they've got worse every time they've changed them for the employee. Mm -hmm. And uh, now they, uh, and that's been a, a big issue about recruiting new employees. It was there when I was a deputy commissioner, and it still is. They have a person, I think, dedicated to just trying to recruit employees now. Uh, so. Okay. Were there promotion opportunities? Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, I guess if I just stayed in research with the Fish and Wildlife Service, I think there would have been a lot of opportunities. And then with the state, there were, I, you know, I never really ever had to apply for a job. It seems like I was always, had people come and ask me, which is fortunate. But I, only, I did apply for a job once when, when uh, with the co-op unit with the, at the University of Alaska, and I wasn't selected. And that's probably the best thing that happened to my career, although it would have been a very different career, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if you could briefly describe the wildlife profession of the day and the changes you've observed over time. Hmm. You know, you go back to, I guess I started working, as you'd say, after my bachelor's degree in 60, I start, so I started working in 69 as a graduate student, but as a research biologist. and. And then as a management biologist, and I'm not sure that much has changed. I think what's, this, you have to ask the same questions, you have to ask them the same way, you test a hypothesis for research. Uh, what's changed is our technology. And we have, when I started there were no computers. Uh, and I was uh, one of the first people that got them in the department. I think I had the second computer in the Department of Fishing and er, er, Wildlife Division. But so the computer, and that's really changed the world. But a lot of technology, like the satellite cars, we used to have to do so much more flying than we do now. And you still have to do some to verify and test, but now it's really changed. So things have changed. I, from on the administrative side, it's gotten much more political because you've got all these groups that didn't used to exist or didn't exist very much. They were all established in the in the late 1960s, early 70s, and we got, that's when we, the environmental movement started. We passed all these big new environmental laws. NEPA mm -hmm. was passed then, the Endangered Species Act. There were probably 10 different bills that you'd say, and that spawned the environmental movement. So that's one of the biggest changes that I see, that no matter what you do now, somebody's gonna not like it. Uh, and especially where you have consumptive use. And uh, I think what I watch, and I watch how the universities are changing, many universities that used to have good wildlife management programs now have conservation biology programs. And I think both are needed, and I think both are fine, but I think they're a little bit different. And you can probably, you know, have a wildlife or a, a conservation biology program that uh, is wildlife oriented, but I think a big, people, we. A lot of places forget, or universities forget, about consumptive use, and I don't think we should want to be careful not to do that. As a statesperson, you know that uh, is, I suppose you could say it's a uh, function of the state government or fish and game departments to provide those opportunities for consumptive use. But it's also the basis for wildlife management, and it's the, it's what's funded wildlife management, and all the advances we've made have come because from hunters and the money they provide through the Pittman-Robertson program. So I think that I've watched it change and it gets more testy, at, 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 you know, there's more people, and then because of the environmental movement and you get all these people and you get sued, then you get people on the other side of the spectrum. So you have these extremes pushing you out on all the time. And I don't, you didn't have that, you, always, you had all controversies back in the 70s too but probably a little bit more intense right now than they've had uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. and that's in Alaska, I'm not sure. I think it's probably the same. You see it in South Dakota with, or North Dakota with this tremendous oil development. And, you know, I've, I've 
think about those wildlife biologists every once in a while that are trying to manage that and manage around it uh, because they're not going to slow it down. The, gov the state wants the money <laughs> and it's tremendous amounts of money. Okay. So what would be your best professional advice for a young conservationist today? Oh, first stay in school, get your education, and really to, to, you almost have to get a master's degree anymore to, to break into the field. And I think then learn to write, learn to communicate with people, and stick with it, you know. I'm not sure what the job market is out there. I haven't worked for six years mm -hmm. since I've been retired. and. Uh, I don't know if there's, it's really tough to get jobs anymore, but I guess I would say, you know, stick with it and uh, if that, that's your dream. And you don't have to have a PhD, it, it, it opens some doors, but if you have a master's degree you can get almost any job in management. Uh, universities you about have to have a PhD to teach. Mm -hmm. so. Great. So what were the most useful tools or instruments you used over the course of your career? Well, I would say the biggest one was computers. I've never been a computer expert, but uh, I've used them extensively. And when I was working on the, on the Kenai, and I had moved to Fairbanks, and, but I still had graduate students, and we wanted to test this carrying capacity model, and we, I, found out, I, I think, the first ones that used it in Alaska, and I may have done it somewhere else, but we use these field computers where we enter, rather than write the data down on a paper, we entered it right into the computer in the field, mm -hmm. and that night we'd come in and put it into a bigger computer that I had to buy myself because the state wouldn't do it, and then we uh, could sum summarize the data that day, and that drove how we sampled the following day, mm -hmm. because we were trying to see how many sample points we needed, how much ver the variability we had out there. Uh, when I, in 1982, there were no computers. We knew we were, they were starting to develop laptops, and the state got in this big fight, and it lasted for two years, whether they were going, to, what kind of computers they were gonna buy, and they decided on Fujitsu's, and then they got sued by Microsoft or some other company, and. Uh, it was a mess and you couldn't buy one. So I bought my own so I could finish the research on the Kenai. And then as management co or research coordinator, before I left, we had a computer on every person's desk. And I also had, we hired a biometrician. One of the first hires I made was, I had a vacant position and I hired the first regional biometrician for the department. We had one person that we called our chief statistician that was in Anchorage and basically what what they did was the drawing hunts and that kind of thing. But I hired a biometrician named Dan Reed. I don't know if you guys know him. He lives in Nome now. And I got so much grief from that for about the first year until everybody realized how valuable he was. He made every project better. He did work both in, not just for the research biologists, but also for the management biologists and how they could, you know, they're collecting all, the, all this data. And, you know, well, if you'd collect it a little different, you can know a whole lot more, you know. And so now we have regional biometricians in every region. In fact, we might have two in one region the department and I'm proud of that getting that done because it was sort of something that I wasn't a popular decision but I think that was really so I would say that I think the computers were the big change but biometricians go along with that you know so that was that and then the working on a satellite collar radios you know that was innovative and that was fun so that uh, got us then started down that road too okay. Great. So what is the most inter interesting project you've been involved with? Well, you know, the ones I liked the most was probably when I was just a simple research biologist at the MRC. Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, had all the freedom in the world. My boss was in Denver. <laughs> and I worked closely with Fish and Game Department. We shared budgets and we were doing things nobody had ever done before you know, measuring moose energy requirements, nutritional requirements, and, and that turns me on. I still like to do that kind of thing, but that's probably not 
what I, I would say that probably the thing as a researcher, the most working on ANWR and developing the satellite radio collars, but also developing a program that gave Congress a whole lot of answers and the decision makers in Washington, D.C. a whole lot of answers. And, you know, what we said there back in, in the early 80s, mid 80s, was you need to protect the calving grounds. And, you know, now the technology has changed so much, they can get to that oil without ever getting within miles of the calving grounds because they can angle drill. So technology there too, but the fight has always been over whether it's going to be a wilderness area rather than oil. But I followed a director named Lou Pamplin who came over from the Fish and Wildlife Service and I was a, his deputy director for six years and, uh, but he was a very autocratic leader. He, he, you know, didn't include anybody and in the decision-making process. And as when I became director, I changed that and in, a, in a very significant ways uh, so that we had, well, I created a program review committee of all the leadership, the, the regional deputy director, assistant directors, and all the regional supervisors. And we'd meet about three or four times a year and talk about where we wanted to go as a division and big issues. As, as director, you still have to make the final decision but I've always found you make better decisions if you get a lot of input, and uh, especially input that doesn't just agree with you. You want Im critical input. Uh, so I did that, but I also, at that time, when I became director, we didn't, we were very oriented towards only uh, consumptive use, and we focused only basically on moose, caribou, sheep, deer, uh, and predator-prey relationships. And so I established a non-game program. Now we have regional super, regional biologists, at least one in every region. We did, and I created a watchable wildlife program to work with the tourist industry. We created a planning division. We'd never had internal planners before. And, and then we created the first strategic plan for the, for the department. So I did worked on a lot of those things. A lot of them were very controversial. There was a group that didn't want you to ever uh, do anything but manage for more moose or more caribou. They just didn't thought that this was all a waste of time. We changed the name of the division from the division game division to Division of Wildlife Conservation. And some people still try to change it back and, and would if they could. Be, but, you know, as a, as a wildlife management agency, we're responsible for all 444 species of wildlife in the state, not just the 10 or 20 species that we hunt and trap. And uh, so I thought we had to have a program to deal with that. And, and so we set all those up and they all continue today. The one that's floundered that hasn't uh, was a watchable wildlife program. Uh, just, uh, you know, when you think about all the tourism and all the opportunities for education, uh, we should do that. The other thing we expanded, we had an, a, a net wildlife education program through Project Wild. I, you've probably heard of that, but we, we created the Alaska Wildlife Curriculum and t t added that to the Project Wild. And we have now wildlife, people working in wildlife education in every region and we didn't have before I was director. So I did, uh, that was, something I thought was important and it was important to deal with. When I became deputy commissioner, well, I started working a lot at the international level then when I became director. I'd always worked uh, closely with, as a research biologist with people in Sweden. They'd been over here and I'd been over there and I went over and evaluated their whole program one year with five other biologists and uh, so I, and I really enjoyed the international uh, work and then I was, when I became director, uh, just through people you meet, I was asked to put on the, a conference in Japan uh, on wildlife biology through the wildlife or the World, World Ecological Congress. They meet every five years, they have like 10,000 people show up and the Japanese were hosting it for the first time and I, why they asked me you know, I don't know, but they gave me $100,000 to do it. Uh, 
I got to invite all my friends to go to Japan. <laughs> and so we put on this big conference and it was very successful. And then when the conference was over, I got, was asked by the Hokkaido governor, Hokai, there's 48 states in Japan and most of them were little things like our counties because it's a small country. But Hokkaido, the big island, is one state by itself. And they had a governor that was rather green and he invited me and there were seven of us from around the world to come and give him advice because he had two big problems. He had about 300 Asian grizzly bears, highly endangered species left and they were only lived on his island. And they all hibernated under these big oak trees that were worth, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars as lumber. So there was this huge conflict, and so we gave them advice. And then they also had sick of deer that were just overrunning them, causing big problems. So you know, wasn't much we could do about that. But I stayed involved with the Japanese and and advised their government. And when I started, they had no wildlife biology programs in the entire country at the universities. They had like three hundred universities not one wildlife curriculum. And we, I says, you, they wanted to become, you know, modern wildlife managers. And I said, you can't just send people to US or England for school. You gotta have it here. And so now there's several, and I've got several publications in Japanese. Don't know what they say for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but that was something that I really thought was important that I did, you know, getting to, uh, to work with and help a, help a country uh, get started in wildlife management. So I enjoyed that, and and then I became uh, the representative for the Wildlife Society, uh, the liaison between the International Union of Game Biologists. And so every two years I'd go to that meeting, and we tried to establish a more close working relationship with them. And it's never worked out very well. They're they're quite parochial or not quite sure they, they don't want us to take over for them and all we wanted to do was work with them. But we've had uh, three world eco uh, international wildlife conferences now. The first one was in uh, Hungary and I helped get that thing going when I was on the council uh, and we went and did that and then there's been one in New Zealand and South Africa. So there's, uh, and those are, you know, I think it's work, important that we work together as that. So, but it, that's an opportunity to travel and I, you know, for a year, I represented, I did that for probably 15 years for the uh, Wildlife Society was the liaison and, and they'd pay my way and I would, uh, they'd buy my ticket and I'd pay for the rest of it. It worked out pretty good. And the other thing I did when I became, was director was, I got real involved. As once you become the director level, you're able to get quite involved in the International Association of Game Biologists, IAFWA they call it. It's the association of all 50 states and the federal agencies are all members too, but it's primarily a state's rights organization. And I worked closely with that. I uh, was a co-chair of the Teaming with Wildlife effort. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. And uh, I was, because I had a clo I knew Stevens, I knew Young, and Young was chair of resources committee. Stevens was on appropriations, so they had me co-chair that with the director from Georgia. And we came, well, we did, what we wanted was a program like PR, where we could have, it would be an automatic, uh, you would put uh, appropriation every year based on taxes on uh, binoculars and backpacking equipment. And we got close, but we never quite got there. Uh, but there's been, the first year we had like $200 million for the non-game program for all the states that divvied up. And it's dwindled down and now it's about 50 million. But it's a provided an opportunity for all 50 states to develop programs in non-game and watchable wildlife. It's, and it forces them to do planning too. And it's, it was a pretty good deal. So I worked on that. That was one of the things I thought was worthwhile for me to do. I, when I was working on as deputy commissioner at IAF, at, through IAF, I created the, an oceans policy committee and chaired that for several years. And we reauthorized work with Congress and got this Magnuson-Stevens Act reauthorized, which is vital to the fisheries. 
and it, it managed all the fisheries from three miles out from the coast to 200 miles. And National Marine Fishery Service does a lot of that, but the state's involved. And that's what you, and the North Pacific Fishery Management Council and Stevens, we changed, we, and they, we didn't have to har argue with him at all, but the only, only uh, fishery council, there's seven of them in the country, uh, that listened and they kind of had a policy they'd always followed the scientists. They have a scientific board tells them what the catch could be, and they never exceeded it. And every all the other six fishery councils, you know, they would they'd meet first and set the quota, and then the scientists would tell them how much they should catch. Eight, and that, that's why there's no cod left on the East Coast. So anyway, now the new law that we've got reauthorized says you cannot exceed the uh, catch level set by the scientists. You know, you can divide it up about who gets what, what the trawlers or versus the bottom people and all that, but you can't t catch more. And it's working. Those fish will come back. So that was something that I, I did. Nobody ever even knew I was doing it because uh, I worked with Stevens and because I spent a lot, when I was deputy commissioner, I spent as much time in Washington, D.C. as I did here. One of our big efforts was we were trying to revise and get EP, the Endangered Species Act amended. Uh, not, and I, I will always fight, we need an Endangered Species Act, it's a good act, but it's being misused and we need to make a change. It's being used as a tool to stop development rather than a tool to protect endangered animals. And we, we came that close. I had all these sponsors and we lost right at the end. Uh, it was an election year and nobody was willing to just step out and be a leader. You know, you see, I found that in Congress all the time. Just nobody wants to take the lead. So anyway, I'm sort of rambling and that's some of the things I, I got to work on and that I thought were important issues that I did work on over the years. Okay. So what was your most pressing issue you had to deal with? <clears throat> Has to be predator management. Mm -hmm. It overrode everything. You know, when I was director, could you use a little history before you go into it? Well, personally? you know, sure. Uh, <laughs> wolves have been harvested for many, many years heavily in Alaska, and but we always had quite a few. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a lot of predator control uh, when we were a territory. Uh, they hired the uh, federal government called the Bureau of Biological Survey, had over 28, had, well, 28, Wolf biology or wolf killers, you know, their full time job was to poison wolves and shoot them and trap them. Mostly they poisoned them, so they did all that. There were bounties on wolves, there were bounties on wolves at statehood uh, 50 bucks a wolf. And and then when we became a state, we became, we became a state in 1959 and took over wildlife management in 1960 uh, in December of 60. December 31st. So really we started managing on our own in 1961 and the state immediately uh, stopped predator management, stopped killing wolves, no poisoning, although they did, uh, they continued for till 1968 paying a bounty and they were, they did, first they stopped poisoning altogether and then the state legislature required them to poison wolves on southeast uh, and they did it for one year and then they quit. But then in 1971, they passed the federal law that you can't use poisons on federal land and that stopped that completely. But we weren't trying to do it, do it anyway. So, but for, when we first became a state, it became quite uh, uh, a lot of politics, lots of people pushing hard for wolf control and they didn't do any for a while. That's my phone, I think. Oh. Um, so anyway, uh, we we didn't do any wolf control, and then we had in 1975. It, I've got this is all documented with all the dates in my book. Mm -hmm. uh, the state started uh, because of pressure to a wolf control program in 1976-77, right in there. And when I became director, you know, it, 
that was a primary issue and it was just we the legislature was pushing real hard what we had was before uh when uh cooper uh, steve cooper was governor of alaska the day he got it the day after he got elected or day after he took office he declared that there would be no wolf control uh, during his tenure of governor and he was only there four years after 18 months in office he announced he wasn't going to run again he hated being governor and so he uh but anyway there was no wolf control but i was a deputy director at the time and i knew that when we got a new governor you know it was and there was tremendous pressure and they to do it but it was just kind of a quiet thing so we started a planning process to develop a plan of, of how to manage wolves a strategic wolf management plan and work with the board of game and i we created a big planning team with 13 people and i represented the department on that and we came up with the strategic plan after cooper wally hickle got elected and he was gung-ho for killing wolves and he ran on the platform that he was going to do that so everything changed from we're not going to do anything until we're going to kill them all and you know we just it was uh, a very uncomfortable time to be in the department and i was still the deputy director uh at that time dave kelly house was named becky's uh dad was named director and he was very controversial because his nickname was Machine Gun Kelly House because he had ordered him, ordered an automatic gun. And he was a very good director, uh, but he had a bad rap about being on wolves. And 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 he had a he he was very adamant that he wanted to harvest wolves. But uh, after a few months, he became a very good director. He was a smart man, and and I worked well with him. But anyway, Hickel. Uh, we, we had a strategic plan and we were just about finished when Hickel got elected and we never quite finished the whole plan. You know, we needed another meeting and the new administration didn't want to share any kind of authority with a planning team. So they, uh, we, we took what we had to the board and they adopted it. And then when the board, the next meeting authorized wolf control. Instead of one area, they did two, and they did it in a big, air, big, you know, all in Unit 13, uh, Game Management Unit 13 by Glen Allen, and everything just hit the fan. I'll tell you, we had we got over a thousand, hundred thousand letters. This was before email, so we got a hundred thousand letters. The phone never stopped ringing. The secretary almost quit, uh, and. Uh, and they also bombarded the governor's office the same way. And Hickel blinked because they had the tourist boycott and he was in the hotel business and he was deathly afraid that it was gonna hurt tourism. So his idea was, all we gotta do is bring all these people together and sit down and talk. And if we, if they, we can explain to them the problem, they'll understand. And I begged him not to do it. Everybody begged him not to do it. It wouldn't work. We just, and he didn't care. It was, he, he was sure it would work. So, and I got the job of organizing the summit because they thought Dave was too controversial. So I was deputy director. I had to orga I organized the whole summer summit. We had, we held it. We had like a hundred people from around the country come and talk, but we held it in the hockey rink in Anchorage or Fairbanks. And there was probably a thousand people in the stands watching us. It was a disaster. Just. People, you know, we had, people wouldn't, they didn't want to talk to each other. They wanted to talk to, at each other. They wanted to talk on television. And when that was all done, Noel, or Hickel said we couldn't use airplanes to kill wolves, but we had to do trapping, you know, tr ground-based wolf control. So they did that and they killed one year. The first year, 100 wolves, and the second year, about 100, maybe a few more. And then, uh... That was four years, and then Hippo got, uh, didn't run, and Tony Knowles got elected governor. And Knowles hated the program, and so he uh, stopped it, the ground-based operation right away, and 
we did, and then he, he hired the National Academy of Science to, er, uh, to come in and do an evaluation of the program. And I sat on that. I was acting director at the time. When Knowles got elected, they fired, well, Cal they tried to fire Kelly House, but he'd already been moved by the commissioner back uh, to a Furbear biologist position in Fairbanks because he only had like nine months left till he could retire. And so the Knowles administration couldn't fire him. He was back in a protected position. And they appointed me as acting. And I wasn't, you know, I was acting for like four months. And they finally then appointed me but uh, as director. So I was director for eight years under Knowles. And he, he, he always, he didn't like wolf control. And I became obvious after a while, he was never gonna do it, but he was never gonna say no. He looked at it as a political, problem that for, to solve rather than a biological problem. So we did all kinds of planning. We did had these planning groups and he did do the allow us to do the sterilization program we uh, in the 40 mile country uh, and we sterilized wolves in I think 12 or 15 packs and to rebuild the 40 mile caribou herd and uh, then we relocated all of the subdominant wolves and just left those the sterilized alpha male and alpha female and they held those territories and the uh, 40 mile caribou heart population almost doubled in four years it was just phenomenal and then over time you know it goes down and but the herd built up pretty high and but Knowles never would uh, did authorize wolf control and he uh, we had just battle after battle and that was the thing that took so much of my time as director, we were in court a lot, uh, and we had all these planning teams, and then the legislature started passing intensive, what they call intensive management laws, trying to force the governor to do wolf control. And they did pass, but that, when I was there, we passed the intensive management laws. Some of them are still on the books, but there were enough loopholes in there that we, you know, even with Murkowski, when I was deputy commissioner, we did some wolf control then, but we didn't have to, didn't do it in the way they did later on, you know. It's, so the laws can be used by uh, managers to do wolf control without, in a proper way, I would say, or without overdoing it, but uh, that's not, it all depends on who the director and the commissioner is, how they want to do it. So anyway, we, that took a great deal of time, and once uh, Knowles got re uh, elected, or re reelected, and then when he was, his eight-year term was up, Frank Murkowski, who'd been our U.S. Senator for 26 years, became governor. And that's when I became, a few months after he was governor, I became deputy commissioner. And uh, I worked quite a bit on wolf management then. We started doing using the intensive management laws and doing wolf control in, in no more than two areas at a time in a small places where we knew that it could have probably work. Wolf control, I've always said, if you want to spend the money, you can have more moose if the habitat's available, uh, good enough to do it. And so uh, they've done that and we, during the, th when I was there as deputy commissioner and Matt Robus was a director, we had a a wolf control program I thought that was reasonable and worked well and, and started to rebuild the moose populations in several areas. And then Palin got elected and the whole scene changed. She was, uh, she appointed people uh, as that, that she wanted to very much expand wolf control and she did a lot of things that over time and uh, I think have been very detrimental to the department, to the state of Alaska. We, uh, and she's inaugurated some of these and she hired a guy, forced the department to hire Corey Rossi, first as assistant director, or assistant commissioner in charge of, how did they put that, uh, abundance, wildlife abundance. Well, then uh, that wasn't good enough and they replaced Doug Larson, who was the director at that time, uh, and got with uh, Corey Rossi as director of wildlife division and then Palin quit and uh, 
Parnell took over and then Parnell was reelected. So Parnell's kept that same leadership people in there. And uh, he's made appointments to the board that, you know, every vote seven to zero and pushing wolf control and bear control. They're killing lots of bears now. They killed over almost 500 ba black bears in Unit 16 uh, last year. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's necessary or appropriate in my mind, but that's where we are now. And then Rossi got, you know, fired because he was violated the laws, mm -hmm. several laws. Uh, but the same policies are continuing. Uh, right now they're going to start doing wolf control on the Kenai National Moose Ranger. Going back in time. <laughs> the Kenai National Wildlife Range. When I first started it was a Kenai National Moose Range. And it was managed for moose. And then in, in 82, when they did in Ilka, they changed the name to the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. But it's all, it can't do wolf control on federal lands. And on the very northern part, there's about 83 square miles that are state lands. So the board is, and the department is going to do wolf control on those 83 square miles that are sort of checkerboarded out there. Impossible to do. Uh, first, that's not good moose habitat there, so there's no moose, so it means there's no wolves, but they're going to do it, you know. So we're doing, I think, the department's doing things that are foolish, just because it's popular, and you shouldn't do it that way. If you, if you want to be popular as director, you should never be director, because you're never very popular. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's. Has this issue been resolved? No, I don't think it ever will be. I think that there's ways to manage it effectively, you know, using a public process. And But I think that when you go start shooting bears out of helicopters, I think the pendulum will swing way past what, what's reasonable. That's my personal opinion. And I'm not in charge anymore, and I'm glad I'm not. <laughs> Has your perspective or opinion on that issue changed over well, time? You know... When I first started, I, I've always felt that it was something that we should do, but you should never do it as, you know, as a everywhere. It should be used in special cases where you've got something has happened and you've had, an, and a population has gotten trouble, and you can go in and you can give it a boost. And but now we're doing it as a routine management practice, you know, all uh, lots and lots of places, and I don't think that's appropriate. So, uh, but I don't think it's changed. I've always felt that way. And then when I was in, at the director, that's how we did it. Well, we did. When I was director, we didn't do anything except the uh, the sterilization program because Knowles would never say no, but he never said yes to wolf control. That's why I got in so much trouble with the legislature. Uh, but under Murkowski, I thought we had a very reasonable and responsible program, and I think it's a little bit uh, over the top right now. And I tell the biologists that too. So what do you think the most difficult thing you had to overcome in your career? I think probably the hardest thing was working with the legislature on intensive management. There were some people in there that were being pushed extremely hard by members of the public and they and we got a law passed when we were all said and done, and Dave Kellyhouse was involved in this at the, at the, uh, for a little while too, uh, was very responsible law that gave us enough caveats that we didn't have to do stupid things. But it also allows you to do really s foolish things if you wish to. <laughs> and uh, so I think that we passed, we got worked with, we're working closely with the legislature, we got laws that really worked and could be managed, so you could be still be, call yourself a professional wildlife manager instead of just a wolf killer. Okay. Um, what was the high point of your career? Mm. I, I thought about that. Uh, I guess probably the teaming with wildlife and getting that money you know, that was such a big deal and such an effort that we did it. Mm -hmm. I thought that was uh, something that was really a, 
a fun job and, and fun to do. Uh, so I I would say that was one of the the things that uh, was a highlight. I the other thing was working on CITES as. Uh, when I was working through the International Association, I was also chair of the International Relations Committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the big things they, that committee does is work on CITES issues, uh, uh, Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. It's a, and it's a United Nations treaty. And I represented the 50 states for several years. Uh, and would go to the, the big meetings where there are 150 countries represented and trying to shift the policy, of the, the international policy on how you manage wildlife. And we, we were very successful when I was there on elephants to keep elephant hunting in certain places because people just want to stop it, you know, and there's, uh, and we've been able to keep that going a lot. So I, I think that was another thing that was a, I don't know if it's a highlight, but it was something that I thought was very worthwhile doing, uh, and I enjoyed it a lot. Okay. What was the low point of your career? Oh. I don't know if I really had any low points. I, I suppose I came home at times, you know, working with the legislature when it was really, you know, you didn't get your way, <laughs> or they did something that you thought wasn't right. Uh, but overall, I've had a very positive career, you know, I think that, uh, so I, I, I don't think I have anything that I'd call a low point. Okay. What's the most, uh, what was your most dangerous or frightening experience? Oh, there? I almost got killed by a moose several times. Uh, when, when we started the moose nutrition program, we had to capture baby, you know, newborn moose. And I, we were out in a helicopter, and they dropped me out, and I go down and to grab the moose and run back, and the cow comes right at me, and I, there's almost no trees, and I got this little tree about, you know, seven, eight feet tall, and I'm standing behind the tree, and this moose is after me, and it, I thought I was just flat going to get killed, and the helicopter pilot was good enough. He came in, and he touched the moose in the butt with the, with the arm, you know, the landing gear. <laughs> that was the most scared I've ever been. I've, I've been, you know, and I've flown hundreds and hundreds of hours in airplanes. And I've never had a frightening experience. You know, just I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. What was your most humorous experience? Oh golly, probably the same thing. <laughs> All the people still teasing me about that moose trying to kill me. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't really. I can't think of anything that was a funny, humorous experience. Okay. What would you consider the three most significant contributions to the field? Mm. I guess I, I would say as a, as a biologist, and uh, it was working, developing the satellite radio collars. I think that was, that's something that has built on and, and it was a real breakthrough and able to, on how we can uh, monitor animals and that was fun to do and I liked that. Uh, I think the other thing was working to make the division a more professional broad-based organization with not just uh, a consumptive use division but we added all these other programs and I think having a planning effort in there was really important. I think you need to have a non-game program and an education program. I think that I'm proud of those, and I think those were something that I look, uh, was something that was really good to do. Uh, so those are kind of one from each. That two, that's two. What would be the third one? Uh, you know, working. Getting the Magnus and working to get the Magnus and Stevens Act reauthorized, and uh, some of the other things, and in, in the funding in Congress. I was able working with Stevens when I was director and also as deputy commissioner. We got millions and millions of dollars for a marine mammal research program. We didn't have Matt. We didn't have. We lost authority to manage marine mammals when they passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act, 
and turn it over to the management of the federal government in, in 1978. But we, uh, when I was, we, we kept a small one, we had one or two people working in marine mammals all the time. But working with Stevens, we expanded that program because marine mammals, first, they are really an important resource to the state. I think as our, you know, for wildlife uh, in general, and they're a very important source of food for the coastal natives. And so we, so I worked with Stevens, and we got, we have just a top-notch first-class marine mammal research program, and probably has ten or twelve people working in it. And they work, and so we can have a major influence on marine mammal management policies without having any management authority because we have the knowledge, and it's worked really well. Mm -hmm. So that's an, that'd be another one. Great. So as you reflect on your, your career, who are the three people you believe are the most influential in developing the field of wildlife management, and why? Well, I guess you always have to name Leopold because he started the whole thing. And Have you read his book? Yes. I used it as a textbook when I was in school. Uh, and it, he had a lot of foresight, and then his writing is, you know, wonderful. He's just an outstanding writer and, and very in, still influential in our program. But, you know, that's, that's sort of ancient history, and I thought about people that have done, you know, really important things that have, I don't know if it's changed is the right word, but directed how, how the, our, our profession has developed. And, and, and one of them is a guy named Gary White. He's a professor of, biometri or bi from, of statistics from Colorado State. Won the Humble, or Leopold Award a few years ago. He's retired now, but he's taught workshops all over the world, but mostly in the U.S. on, cap on how to use statistics the right way and how to design experiments. He's had a tremendous influence on our field. I really think he has. And he's a good man. And then another one that I think that nobody thinks about is Max Peterson. Max Peterson was the chief of the Forest Service for like eight years under the first Bush. He's the one that started the multiple use and, you know, de developed a wildlife program in the Forest Service. And then after he retired, well, you know, don't last as chief too long, but I think he was eight years. He became the uh, executive director of the International Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And he made that, age, he, you know, he turned kind of a club and into a really vibrant organization that had tremendous influence in Congress. And we had many times, we, well, every, it happens probably every five to ten years, there's a big move to divert the PR funds to something else. The last one was, you know, the, uh, the victims of gun violence. So, and right now it's dedicated to just wildlife. And he led the efforts and stopped those things dead in their tracks several times. Very influential person, made, really worked and made most of the state wildlife agencies better. I'm just convinced that he did through his leadership. So those are three people and two of them probably not very many people know or know about. But to me, I think they're uh, pretty, did, did a you know, significant contribution. Okay. What do you think makes a great wildlife manager? Oh. I think first you have to have a good biological background and understand population dynamics. Uh, and it's hard to do without that. You have to be, you know, a manager versus a researcher are very different. But a manager, they need to be able to communicate well with, with the public. They need to be able to listen and hold their ground. You know, we have to have managers that have a biological bottom line, you know, that says, we're not going to do that. That's not right. And uh, even no matter how much political pressure you get. And we, we, so I think we have to do that. And I, I worry a little bit about what kind of students we're putting out today. You know, I think they're highly educated in biology and statistics, but I'm not sure they are taught anything about hunting or consumptive use 
and a lot of them don't have an appreciation for it. And I don't know if you can necessarily teach a course in that in college. I don't think you could, but I think there's other, you know, you, uh, you kind of have to learn that on the ground once you get to working. But so many of the people I see coming out of school have no appreciation for hunting. They aren't hunters. They don't want to be. And they don't understand that hunting is what has paid the bills and has made all these advancements, you know, since the 1930s. And I don't know how we change that. That's why I feel like what you teach in the university is a course in, in the history of wildlife management. And I, I thought that's why the bulletin had had that history in it. And I, I, I thought for a while, you know, that one of the things I thought about doing, and I might still try, is develop a course in uh, history of wildlife management and then go around and teach it for a few weeks at each at different universities just as a volunteer. I don't know if universities would care. I think some would, and some aren't very interested in that anymore. But I think that as, as a wildlife society, we really need to do that. I was on the council back in the 90s for three years, and I pushed for that, and, and I hope that this interview is maybe a result of that, that that's there, that people are, still thinking we need to have some history. Mm -hmm. Okay. Name three skills that a good wildlife professional should have. Well, for, I think you have to have a good biological background. And, mm -hmm. and I think not just biology, but I think that you need a background in, in statistics or biometric, biometrics or whatever you want to call it. Because I think you need to know, when you collect data, you need to collect it in the right way so that it's useful and usable. I think probably the other one is, is good communication. You know, that's to listen, which is hard for me to do, but it's hard for everyone, you know, but, but you need to be a good communicator. And the biggest part of that and the hardest part probably is listening uh, and hearing what the other people are saying. So I think that those are the, the a couple of the things that uh, a good wildlife biologist needs. And I don't think that you have to be a hunter to be a wildlife, good wildlife biologist. I know a lot of them that are very good wildlife biologists that aren't, but they understand hunting and they're not, you know, and they just don't do it themselves. And they understand its value and it, uh, it's a way that we manage populations. Okay. So why become a wildlife professional today? I still think there's a lots of opportunities and, uh, to manage consumptive use and just to make sure that the world's managed properly, you know, or uh, I, I, I hope that we have, I think that we have really good, smart people in the wildlife profession now. And I think it's amazing to me when I, gra my graduating class, we had, I think 48 people and one female. And today at Colorado State, probably 60 or 70 percent of the graduating classes is female. I think that's good. I think that's healthy for us. It'll swing back and probably level out again. But boy, when I, you know, a long time ago, 30, 40 years ago, it was a rare thing to have, uh, have women in it. And that's one of the things that I was proud of when I was director. I had the first assistant director was a woman, the first area biologist and uh, I think those were important there was that glass ceiling out there but you you know you have to help break it and but I think on today's uh, you know why why would people want to be a wildlife biologist same reason I do it's a wonderful profession you know you can make a contribution to the world I think and people are interested in it and you, we need to do it right Okay. So how did your membership in the Wallace Society help your career? You know, I joined in 1966 when I first went to Colorado State. They had a student chapter and I went to the first meeting and there were probably six people there, you know, and they just amazed me. I thought everybody, I thought the whole, you know, class would be there and uh, over time it grew quite a bit. So, but I was uh, active in it all the time, and I think it, it it's, uh, 
I don't know if you'd say it opens doors, but you meet people. It, it's, I think it's a responsibility to be part of our professional society. I've always said that everybody should be a member. I don't think you can mandate it, but I think that I really urge people that work for me, you know, to be involved. And you don't have to, you know, be in the forefront. You can, you know, do, there's lots of things you can do. You can just be an editor, be edit papers or referee or whatever, you know. There's lots of different ways to, to contribute. And I found, you know, I think working with uh, the local chapters, I really like. I've never got very involved in the in the northwest section because it was just it's a long ways away uh, and expensive to go to. I did go to set when I was on the council uh, for those three years. I went to several of the meetings in the northwest section to you know to be the representative uh, and enjoyed that. Uh, and but I think that it's something that you shouldn't join it for what you can get out of it. You should join it for what you can do for it. And I think it's it's highly a valuable part of our profession. I just think that it uh, we need to have that voice of independent voice of just biology or science, and sit down. You can sit down before Congress, or write these professional policy papers, and so that people know what's going on and have a have a source of information that's not biased. And I think that we have a pretty good reputation. Tom Franklin for many years was our lobbyist. Was not he was that's not what his title was, but that's what he was. He was he was our representative in, on Congress and now he's moved over. I think he's working for Ducks Unlimited. No, Nature I don't know where Tom went, but he left now. But he was uh, would testify before Congress on many, many bills and the budget. And I think the Wildlife Society has a very good reputation on the Capitol Hill and opens doors for us. And, and we should, we should have that influence. Okay. What are your thoughts on the future of the profession? You know, I think it's, it's bright. I, I guess I watch this kind of almost a split between conservation biology and wildlife biology, and I don't think it should be there. I don't think we need that. I don't think it's healthy. I can kind of see why it's happened, and, and you know, you get into the east and, this, and some of these places where hunting isn't a big deal, and, and most of the people that are going to school don't want to be hunters, but I, I'm not sure that it, uh, they shouldn't be learn some of that to be a, a, a field biologist and not understand consumptive use, I don't think is uh, productive for the for the world. But I think that uh, I see it coming. I hope it I hope it changes, and I hope we start teaching more about history of of, wild, of the wildlife profession because I think there's a lot we can learn from the past. Okay. Well, is there anything else you'd like to tell others about your career? Gosh, I can't. I think we covered everything. Yeah. I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you have not. recently written the written a book, Fish oh. Politics and Wolf Wars: The History of Fish and Game in Alaska. What what influenced you well, to write that book? You know, I when I retired, I was looking for something to do, and I decided we didn't have any record of who was in the leadership positions in the department back from back to the statehood. There just was no record. And I thought, pretty soon that's going to be lost. So I started, I put that together and started doing that and did a lot of reading and I, and it just sort of built into a book. Mm -hmm. And, and so I talked about, the book covers the history of fish and wildlife management in Alaska, basically from, it's a history of the department. You know, you could write another history of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I touch on the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service in my book, but it's oriented towards the Fish and Game Department. And I go, you know, I start out, uh, well, a long time ago, but I started out basically in the Russian era, mm -hmm. talked about that quite a bit, and then territorial days, and I just started reading about that and found it fascinating. So I, that, that kind of led to the book, mm -hmm. and I'd written quite a bit about the history of wolf control, mm -hmm. because I did it for the board of game. Uh, when, I was, when I was director, we had quite a few new people on the board that just, you know, get thrust into this and they didn't know it. So I wrote, it was probably a 25 page 
history back starting in territorial days of history of wildlife or wolf management in Alaska and, and that sort of I used that and expanded on it but then I talked quite a lot about fisheries and then and I enjoyed that I learned a lot because I didn't uh, look, I didn't ever deal much with fisheries at all until I became deputy director or deputy commissioner, and there I did quite a lot on, on oceans policy and trying to, how we're going to manage uh, the oceans. So I put that in, and and you know it's a real for salmon. It's a success story. The Fish and Game Department, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, is probably the premier salmon managers in the world. There's nobody. And they do a wonderful job, and and we've got hatcheries, we've got the laws, you know, limited entry changed a lot of things, but we just do it right, and we do it all on the local level. They give the area local area biologists authority to shut, to open or close the seasons for the commercial fishermen, and it, that's that works, and it's worked well. So I enjoyed doing that. I, I can't. I wish I could say that they manage do as good a job of managing shellfish and they don't and part of it is we've just never put the money there and we should uh, crab industry is in real bad shape right now and you know we used to we just over harvested it without knowing what we were doing and it still hasn't come back mm -hmm. after 25 30 years in Kodiak there's still no commercial season okay. But anyway, I enjoyed writing the book. It was it was fun, interesting to do. So just one last question here. You know, you always hear that you know Alaska is unique by the senators, by pretty much everyone in Alaska. So give me a few examples of what's unique in Alaska for wildlife management. Well, we're big. Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're twice as big as any other state, and most states. Are much smaller so we have a tremendous amount of country to cover and not very many people to do it and we have uh, since 82 we have a tremendous uh, increased numbers of national parks and uh, national wildlife refuges uh, we have the two largest forests in the world are in the nation in Alaska uh, and so you have a, a big federal presence and I think that we need to work together. One of the things, I, when I was director, I prided myself. We worked very closely, had all these cooperative projects with the fit, mostly the Fish and Wildlife Service, but also the Forest Service and the BLM. And we worked together, collecting data. You know, we'd, a lot of times we'd go to the Board of Game and we'd, you know, our biologists may sit there and sitting right beside him would be a Fish and Wildlife Service guy. And I think that was healthy. I think those, that's sort of a probably unique uh, to Alaska, and we aren't doing that anymore, and we should. Uh, you know, we can't, every, every agency is different, every agency has its own mission and its own responsibilities, and they're different than ours, but that doesn't mean we can't work with them. And they have, the bot, same, a lot of the same bottom lines are the same, you know, especially the Fish and Wildlife Service, BLM. Park Service is a little bit, they have a different mandate, you know, their mandate is to just preserve. And, but the other agencies are management agencies, just like we are. Okay. So that's, and I'm not sure what else is, those are the, probably the two things that are the most unique about Alaska. It's just the size and, and the, the federal presence are big things. But the other thing that was unique there for a while is we had lots of money. Oil development, you think about oil development and it's, how it's impacted the state of Alaska is tremendous, but how it's affected the department is just phenomenal, you know, because all of a sudden we had money to do all kinds of things. And we hired good biologists and because we paid good salaries and they had money to do things. So we could recruit the brightest and the best for a long time. And now that's changed. Hmm. Slowly, gradually, you know, the legislature hasn't kept salaries competitive. And so we don't get the best and the brightest anymore because they can make a whole lot more money otherwise. And don't, you know, people, some people will come to Alaska just because they want the experience, but they don't stay. Okay. Well, Wayne, it's been a pleasure talking right. with you and uh, sharing your experiences with us. Well, thanks. I enjoyed it.